Hello everyone, Patricia is Giovanna Magier. Today's topic is discourse analysis. I'm going to explain text and interpersonal meaning. You know that in discourse, in using language, we can establish a relationship between us, between you and the other persons. And we can use language to do that. Okay, let's dive into my PowerPoint to hear from me. This is the topic for today, text and interpersonal meaning. Yes, this is a topic for today, text and interpersonal meaning. It's taken from this chapter, chapter 3, uh, page 83 up to the end of the chapter. So you might read that before class, before my lecture, to make it clearer, of course. In this chapter, uh, there are some essential points that I would like to explain. Uh, this, the first one is the vocab and grammar, reflect and create social relationship between the sender and the receiver. So that's why it is called interpersonal meaning, uh, which means that uh, we relate to others by using the language that we produce, by using the vocabulary and the grammar that we produce in our language. Uh, another important point is that we regulate others' behavior by command and questions. Later, I'm going to explain how we regulate or control others' behavior by issuing command or questions. Yeah. And um, uh, the next one is we reduce or increase the degree of assertiveness of our statement or dogmatism in our statement by using model auxiliaries, uh, verbs dealing with frequency and universality. So the idea is, if you do not want to sound too assertive, if you do not want to sound too dogmatic, you can manipulate the language that you produce using models, frequency, and words uh, concerning universality. Okay, uh, I'm going to explain it in a minute. So as I said before, we regulate others' behavior, we control their behavior by command and questions. It's very easy to see. The examples are very obvious. If somebody says to you, wash the dishes, that's a command. She or he is controlling your behavior by issuing a command, wash the dishes, and then you will do it accordingly. Or somebody else says to you, hold my hand, and then you will do it accordingly. Your behavior is controlled by the command, by the instruction. Or a question, what time is it? If somebody asks you this, you will uh, turn to your watch or look at the clock and says what time it is. Again, it is a way of controlling your behavior. That is by asking a question. Or another example will be, have you done the assignment? That's also controlling your behavior. If you, if you are asked this question, you will, you will be forced, you will be made to say something as the answer okay um, okay let me continue to um, our main material i will explain directly from there yeah. so you have uh, here um, yeah this is actually the the chapter Uh, okay, so this is what I have explained by issuing command and applications. Also, look at here that you can use uh, model auxiliary, model constructions to uh, tone down or to soften your statement. Yeah. So, for example, if you want to is issue an application, something that uh, the others must do, you can play with the model auxiliaries in order to vary the, uh, the, the degree of application. Yeah. Uh, well, excuse me for this uh, not very decent <laughs> example in our culture, but it's okay. Just disregard the casual sex here in the condom. Uh, focus on the, the word of model auxiliaries here. So, um, from 1 to 8, 
you have the ascending order of strength of obligation. So if you go further down here, the further down you go, the the more obligation, the stronger the obligation is. Yeah. So you can use condom for casual sex. You you know this is this sounds this means that you are allowed or permitted to. And then you may use condom for casual sex. You might use. You need to. You will use. You should use. You are to until you must. Now this is the strongest obligation. Again, by using different model auxiliaries, you can vary the degree of obligation. Okay. Um, questions? Uh, I have explained this. Uh, this chapter also explains expository questions, a question which the writer or speaker herself goes on to answer. It is a way of introducing or stimulating interest in an issue or a discourse topic. So it's good for you to use expository questions to start your speech. The second one is a rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions do not need to be answered. They do not demand an answer. They they serve just to raise people's awareness or or make people attend to your ideas that is coming further. Yeah. Okay, you have a... Uh, I'm going to explain synthetic personalization later after this. Now, assertiveness. This is where you can uh, use different words. You can play with language in order to strengthen your assertiveness or to reduce your assertiveness. Yeah. So you can use this with uh, models of probability. You can vary your assertiveness by using models of probability. For example, in the sentence, this 10-year-old car doesn't have a smoky exhaust. And then this 10-year-old car is unlikely to have a smoky exhaust. The next one, this 10-year-old car may have a smoky exhaust. Then this 10-year-old car will have a smoky exhaust. Next, this 10-year-old car must have a smoky exhaust. And last, this 10-year-old car has a smoky exhaust. So the further down you go, the more assertive you are. The more you are certain about your the truth of your statement. Yeah, that's the further down you go. Compare uh, saying this 10-year-old car doesn't have a smoky exhaust and this 10-year-old car is unlikely to have a smoky exhaust and this 10-year-old car has a smoky exhaust. Yeah. So items number one until number six are statements about a particular car. Uh, at the two extremes, one and six, we have the pair negative and positive statements. Sentences two up, up to five express increasing degrees of probability or certainty. Yeah, so the further down you go, the more likely it is, the more probable it is. The further down you go, the more possible it is. Okay? Um, yeah, that's uh, models of probability. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can always uh, read that part yourself so that you will have a more complete uh, understanding okay what I'm doing is just to give you a general explanation uh, of a certain topic okay? now in terms of frequency you can also play with words concerning frequency to reduce or to strengthen your assertiveness so for example this 10 year old car never has a smoky exhaust this 10 year old car occasionally has a smoky exhaust sometimes has a smoky exhaust Often has a smoky exhaust, frequently has a smoky exhaust, always has a smoky exhaust. See, never, occasionally, sometimes, often, frequently, always are words that have something to do with frequency. Are words that uh, tell how frequent, how frequently something happens. Yeah. So you can use never until always. Now this is absolute. You are being very assertive here. If you say to somebody, you are always late. Now, that is a very strong assertive statement. Yeah. Okay. So be careful with uh, uh, words like always because it makes things absolute. Yeah. It comes across as a very assertive uh, statement. Yeah. 
and also uh, universality uh, you can again play with language in order to uh, manipulate or to vary the degree of universality uh, for example 10 year old cars don't have smoke exhausts no 10 year old cars have smoke exhausts a few some many most all 10 year old cars yeah so you can see that the further down you go the more universal it is yeah uh, you have a no, you have a few, you have some, you have all. Yeah, so you can sense that uh, the degree of universality is getting higher the further down you go, the list here. Okay. And uh, so this time you are using the these words in order to vary the degree of universality in your statements. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's uh, my main topic. Let's see if I have something else to explain from here. Um, yeah, now this is the assignment for you. Please reduce the dogmatism or assertiveness in these sentences. I have three sentences here. Coronavirus will kill you. Students of this campus are rich. You are always late for class. This is very absolute, it's very high in pragmatism and assertiveness. Now your task is to reduce them using the words that I have just explained. Model auxiliaries, words uh, of frequency, etc. Okay? Um, Okay, I promise that I am going to explain synthetic personalization. Okay, here it comes. So synthetic personalization is uh, treating mass audience as if they were individuals. Yeah, so it's actually like uh, speaking to a mass, to a lot of people, but in such a way so that every person feels like he or she is being uh, addressed individually or being talked to individually. Yeah, this is called synthetic personalization. Yeah, so, so it is very typical in advertisement. For example, if you read this sentence, do you want to enjoy a tour with cheap tickets? Now, the minute you listen to this, the minute you hear this, or the minute you read this, you feel as if the advertiser is talking directly to you. Yeah, it's talking directly to you. You have the sense of being addressed to individually. You have the sense that she or he, the advertiser, is talking directly to you. In fact, uh, the advertiser is actually talking to a lot of people. But when you read this, it feels as if you are the only one that he or she is talking to. And that is called synthetic personalization. It's quite typical in advertisement. Yeah? And it quite frequently used the word you. Yeah. Okay. And then you have a minor sentences. Minor sentences are sentences with subject or the main verb dropped. Again, this typical in conversation and used in written ads, in written advertisements. Why do advertisements use this? Because they want to be closer to you. They want to bring themselves closer to you. Because if you feel that closer bond, then you will be interested in their product. Okay. For example, pushing dengan urusan kantor. Yeah, this is a, a way of a minor sentence. Okay. Uh, oh, I should have enlarged this. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's the example. Thank you and good luck.